After finishing all the preparations, Laura and Pete were glad to be sitting in the Bali flight's departure room. Although Laura was tired from last night's events, she was looking forward to her vacation. While looking at a message, Pete told Laura that she needed to turn her phone off, but she hadn't brought it with her. After getting worried, Pete showed Laura a dangerous text message that was sent to him on his phone. Although Laura told him it might be a mistake, Pete said his wife knew about their affair. They thought that it might be a wrong number or meant for someone else despite their panic. It occurred to them to call their friends to see if there was anything unexpected. While Laura watched, Pete called a number and left a message, but no one answered. He was wishing for her. Pete was confused, so he asked Laura to call her husband. I forgot my phone, but she offered to let me use hers. That's when they both understood how silly the situation was, and Laura felt regret for the first time. Unfortunately, the boarding call cut their talk short. Although they were in line together, they didn't hold hands in public. Laughing at Laura, Pete looked through the crowd for familiar faces as people walked to their places. Later, Pete asked Laura why she wasn't carrying her phone with her while she was sitting down and resting her head on his shoulder. I'll explain later, she said, it's part of my plan. After taking off, Laura pulled out her laptop and opened a document that showed how she planned for their future together. Give Pete the computer and tell him her big idea for the future of their relationship. No changes were made to the original sentence as it is already a love letter. Thinking about the future, I'm looking forward to the next 25 years and beyond. Sharing my life with you has always been my greatest wish. Every day, my love for you gets stronger, and I'm beyond excited to take care of you and our beautiful kids. After knowing how much you love me and want me to be happy and content, I haven't asked for much for myself besides visiting friends every once in a while. To continue the love we share, I'd like to talk about something significant. Given that I'm worried that talking about my idea in person might lead to mistakes, I've given you two weeks to think about it. As a result, I left my phone behind so I can think without interruption. Understanding that I'm not at any work-related event and no one there knows where I am, trying to get in touch with me would be pointless. I love you so much, my dear, and I treasure every moment in your arms. Although I have to say that I really want to be close to other people, this wish really bothers me. Let me explain before you respond. I intend to spend two weeks with a co-worker, but I promise you that I have never cheated on you and never will. Please consider my suggestion. Based on your permission and understanding, I'd like to explore sexual relationships with other guys. These days, my wants are different from what your love and skill can provide. Don't worry, it won't affect anyone you know, and I promise to keep it completely secret. If our friends or contacts develop even the slightest suspicion, I'll stop right away. Relax, you can always have me whenever you want, and our connection will stay the same. Our lovemaking won't change at all because of this plan. Please consider it carefully over the next two weeks. Consider this your chance to show that you really love me as much as you say you do. Trusting that you love me will keep me comforted while I'm away. I want you to think about this for two weeks, my dear. Anytime you say, no, I will accept your choice and be open to more conversation. No matter how mean or doubtful you are, I will try not to take it personally. Answering, yes, is enough. We don't need to go into more detail, but feel free to talk about it if you'd like. Bye, Laura. Pete exclaimed when he was done reading. That was pretty amazing, right? Laura admitted that she had taken some lines from an erotica story she found online. Pete said, I can handle two weeks with you, but finding your replacement is another story. You seem confident he'll agree, Laura said. Pete explained, I made it look like he has a choice, but if he says no, we'll keep sneaking around. Thoughts? Pete asked. Logical and decisive, Laura answered. Unfortunately, he won't make a sensible choice. Laura, I hope he's not too proud. He won't be hurt. Pete reassured her, I spent days perfecting it. 
Whatever the case, Laura warned, men are sensitive about their performance. Pete predicted that he would either give in or get defensive. It's risk-free for me to ask first, Laura maintained, and he'll appreciate my honesty and give it some thought. Although Pete lied to get away from his wife, he was suspicious of his potential lover because he knew she was lying. Laura's manipulation bothered him, so he asked her about her previous story and learned that her husband had kicked her out, which was probably meant to calm her down. Feeling worried, Pete changed the subject, hoping she wouldn't follow through with the idea in her letter. During their innocent holiday, Laura talked about meeting a disturbing person at international registration. She described how he made a disturbing motion by slashing his finger across his throat. After Pete described the man's appearance, Laura suddenly became serious. She grabbed her laptop and looked at a picture of herself with a man in front of a house. She asked Pete in a worried voice if the man in the picture was him. While looking closely at Peter, Laura wondered if he was trying to trick her. She wondered if he was afraid that her husband would find out and make her unavailable for two weeks. Peggy realized that Peter wasn't trustworthy because he was ready to cheat. What was that guy wearing? Laura asked. Pete told her that he dropped her off at the domestic terminal and didn't think he could have followed her to the international one. She told Laura about their beach house, bragging about how it could be folded up and had an artistic interior. Laura was still suspicious and needed more distractions. Is that your house? Laura asked. They won awards for the design and strategic use of the land, which included a creek running under the house. The chat then turned to their families, which they had been trying to avoid. Pete talked about his two kids, who are six and eight years old. As a way to take her mind off of things, Laura talked about her three children, Sarah, 23, who just graduated from law school and is now a real estate lawyer, Daniel, 16, and Larry, 13. Unsure if her husband was watching her, Laura couldn't make plans. She focused on keeping her home and family safe and scolded herself for not facing reality sooner. She carefully packed for her claimed business trip while sneaking in things for her Bali vacation. As usual, Laura went to work on Friday and made plans for her husband to pick her up. They spent time with the kids and then made love late into the night, with Laura's excitement fueling their attraction and her husband's lack of knowledge. As soon as Saturday morning came, Laura headed to the airport. She remembered how nervously she asked her husband to drop her bags off at the check-in counter and leave, and how relieved she was when he agreed. As she watched him leave, she noticed something different about how impatient he was. It was like she was carefully planning her behavior. No one at work knew about her trip, and her husband didn't know any of her co-workers. Pete's text message was a joke, and the man at check-in was just a stranger. With the letter's contents in mind, Laura tried to calm down by thinking about what would happen if her husband found out she lied about where she was going. She knew she had done something very wrong. During the flight, Laura focused on destroying the letter and telling herself she wasn't worried about anything. Sarah received a detailed letter from Laura, who was always ready for anything. She couldn't send it right away, but she asked Sarah to do two things, change Laura's phone number to Pete's and get a personal letter from under her father's pillow, making it clear that it was private. Laura trusted Sarah's judgment and closeness to follow her instructions. Additionally, Laura asked Sarah to confirm getting the letter and let her know when the tasks were finished. When Laura got to Denpazar, she called and emailed her husband from Pete's phone but didn't get a response, which worried her. Prior to getting to the hotel, Sarah called Pete's phone to make sure the work was done. Laura didn't ask what was going on, but Sarah's news shocked her, her dad had taken the other kids to their house in the country. Being confused, Laura let her daughter make the choice without asking her further questions. Laura's husband had just cooked a barbecue dinner at the cottage for his three kids, and the next day they begged him to take them camping to catch wallabies for their favorite campfire stew. While the family was together, Sarah brought up her father's distraction and asked, Is it because of mom? As her dad continued, the room became tense as he said, Yeah, she's been acting strange and emotionally distant for months now. That's exactly what your mom told me, she's going on a two-week work course abroad. 
Yesterday, I saw her talking to a man at her office, and something didn't seem right. He was identified as Peter Auer. This morning I found her passport with an Indonesian visa stamp from three weeks ago. Bali, where she was reading a brochure last month, is in Indonesia. In addition to within the same state, it also happens internationally. He paused to think about what to say next. I didn't approach her. Accusing someone of stealing without proof is a serious matter, especially if that person is someone you love. Sarah stepped in and reminded her father of the values that are important to their family, honesty, integrity, and respect. Their father's voice was heavy with emotion as he talked. This morning, mom asked me to drop her off at the domestic terminal and leave, he said. As planned, I went to the international terminal and saw my mom checking in for a trip to Bali with Peter Auer, a co-worker. I was shocked and didn't know how to talk to her about it. In response to Sarah's question, do you think mom lied to us, their father admitted, moving away and looking hurt. Seeing him like this, they all rushed to soothe him and were ready to do anything to make him feel better. Sarah spoke up again and asked her father what his plan was. He said he wasn't sure, but he made it clear that cheating would get them divorced. While he was thinking, he sent a warning message to both his wife and the man she was with, delaying a decision. Sarah told him that her mom had left her phone at home, so she hadn't seen the message. She offered to call her, but her dad wouldn't let her, he said her mom had to take responsibility for her actions without being forced. Later, Sarah shared the phone number her mother had given her and matched it with a number on her dad's business card. This proved that his story was true, but there was more. Craig handed Sarah's dad the letter her mom had asked her to get and told him to read it. He hesitated, but Larry insisted, stressing that the family made choices together. Dave looked at his youngest son with pride. During their family's worst crisis, he was more mature than even his own father. After hugging, Dave started to read out loud, focusing on the third paragraph. It was a wife's request to her husband that seemed reasonable, but one sentence revealed a lie that tainted the whole communication. Following a long argument, they came to the conclusion that their mother's actions should have serious consequences, possibly even being kicked out of the family. Dave defended his wife and told his kids not to let her actions change how they felt about her, but Larry disagreed and said that her lie had already cut them off from their family. While watching his son's determined behavior, Dave noticed how much he and his son were alike. Update, Laura surprised Pete at the hotel front desk by asking for a separate room on a different floor, booked for two days with the option to stay longer. Although he was confused, Pete did what she said and met her in the hallway in two hours. When he saw Laura's clothes, he felt a strong desire. Laura told Pete about recent events, such as a threatened message on his phone and her husband's strange behavior. Pete understood what was going on, but he didn't feel like it was relevant to him. Although Laura was sure that her husband might know about their affair and the consequences, she didn't want to put her marriage at risk, so she insisted that they not sleep together until she was sure that her husband didn't know. Peter was disappointed, but Laura anticipated his objections and ignored them, challenging him to see things from her husband's point of view. Following his logical answer, she remained annoyed by his apparent failure to comprehend her situation. Have you attempted to call your wife again since you arrived? This question caught Peter's attention. He searched the dimly lit hall for any surveillance cameras. No problem, I'll sleep in my room by myself tonight and tomorrow. We'll figure this out when my husband gets back and can reach me. To avoid physical interaction, stay away from my room unless it's a public place until then. If my husband calls, don't answer or send him to voicemail, find me quickly. Here are the numbers he'll use. Following her instructions, Peter gave her a friendly kiss on the cheek, and the two of them went back to their rooms, worried that someone might be watching them. If they had checked the phone number from Pete's threat, they would have seen that Laura was already greatly affected, but she didn't know it. Update, days had passed, and their much-anticipated trip hadn't gone as planned. Since they were together every day in case Dave called, they didn't touch each other while eating at the hotel restaurant, 
and Laura dragged a reluctant Peter to several clothing stores to get new clothes. Peter refused to go until Tuesday night, when he booked an extra room, made sure he wasn't being followed, and spent the night with a Javanese courtesan. Concerned about her family's silence, Laura spent Wednesday looking into divorce online and talking to her lawyer. When Dave and Sarah didn't answer their calls, Laura's worry grew, and she felt more and more alone. She begged Sarah to get in touch with her, knowing that Dave didn't usually use email. No response by Friday, so Laura took action to protect her future. With the help of her lawyer, she secured the family finances by transferring ownership of a piece of land to a trust with herself and Sarah as trustees. She then split the rest of the money into separate trusts for their minor children, making sure that access required two signatures, one from the child and the other from their legal guardian. Laura was relieved and slept better knowing she had control over the money in case of an emergency. On Saturday, two shocking events rocked her world. Pete went to her room without her permission, telling her that his wife knew about their situation. Additionally, Laura found out that Dave had been lying about where he was, which made Peter rush home to deal with the consequences. Laura quickly finalized the financial changes with her lawyer, drove Pete to the airport, and moved into his empty room. The second blow was much closer to home and was more devastating. Checking her younger children's Facebook pages, Laura saw that they hadn't posted anything new, but Larry's page had a shocking post about his parents' split. No. Laura screamed in a room that was empty, confused by David's actions. They eventually got a divorce, which led to fights, conversations, and sometimes humiliations. Even though he was the main provider for the family, her husband had too much of an effect on their children. Laura prayed hard, hoping to see signs that would stop her and Pete's plans before they happened. Alternatively, Dave would soon get a report from a private detective confirming that nothing bad had happened. Since Peter was gone, all of her efforts seemed pointless. Once she calmed down, Laura's common sense took over. She used her intelligence to look at Dave's point of view objectively. She came to the conclusion that someone other than Dave, probably Peter's wife, had learned about her Bali trip and told him about it. This made her think about Sarah's possible role if she had disobeyed Laura's instructions about the letter. Sarah had shared the letter with Dave, so Laura got it and carefully read it. It was full of both truths and lies, and Laura knew that Dave would doubt all of her promises, even the nice things she said about Peter. Understanding that her actions had hurt Dave's pride in their relationship, even though she hadn't betrayed him, Laura planned for him to have doubts about her loyalty, thinking about when the surveillance might have started. Once they checked into the hotel, the choice to ask for a private room would have been recorded. Laura thought about it, struggling with many unknowns. The letter's fourth paragraph, which had been written with sincerity, now seemed empty and dishonest. Fearing that Dave had read it, she thought she could still save the situation by carefully manipulating him. But if he had, she knew that no amount of lying would be enough. Realizing how ironic it was that her only hope was the private investigator's report in Bali, which would prove her innocence. Laura felt bad about the hasty choice she had made and needed a night of drinking to realize she was the stereotypical wife with a secret life. Despite her successful career, she hated how her past had limited her and looked for comfort in lying and cheating. Her newfound self-awareness did not make her laugh. Laura was faced with the unsettling possibility of being both a successful businesswoman and a divorced person still wanting to satisfy her desires. Before she went home, Laura realized she couldn't find answers where she was. She wanted to stop David from doing anything that couldn't be undone, so she wrote him a letter through Sarah. To keep things unclear, she wasn't sure if Sarah had shared the letter with her father or even read it herself. Laura was determined to handle her divorce calmly, believing she could win if things got worse. Being a meticulous planner, Laura set up counseling sessions with local therapists and made an online appointment with the counselor she had chosen. She then got ready for a day tour she had booked earlier, planning to call the airline before leaving. Update Sarah goes into her dad's house and hears the end of a talk between him and the neighbor. 
Dave, besides telling Peter's wife about your suspicions, what else have you done? Nothing. Greetings, Sarah. I believe you recognized John Smith from your next-door neighbor. He is also a lawyer and has kindly agreed to assist me. Okay, Dave. This is the least I can do after all the gardening help and advice you've given me over the years, not to mention the tools you've lent me. Hi, Sarah. Hey John, are you here to help Daddy with his divorce? Ha, huh, who's talking about divorce? So far, all we know for sure is that your mom lied to us and is in Bali for two weeks with someone. Personally, I will wait to hear what she has to say before making any choices about getting a divorce. Please forgive my forgetful dad, John. He's quite naive at times. Yesterday, Mom's lawyer called me to ask me to sign a trust agreement that allows Mom to take control of some family assets. We then checked all the bank and investment accounts and found that most of the money had disappeared. She's doing everything she can to clear you, Dad. It's official, Sarah gave her dad two pages of the letter that she had printed. Taking a quick look, he handed them to John. Dear Sarah, could you please print out the attached document again and give it to your father? I'm counting on you not to read it because it's about private matters between us. You probably already know that I lied to you about the reason and location of my trip this week. When I get back, we'll talk about it, and I hope you'll listen to me as you always have. Before you decide what to do, please think about two things. Firstly, I love you and only you. This has never changed and never will. Secondly, I have been loyal to you ever since we promised to be together years ago. A recent event may have made you question my loyalty, and I'm ready to do whatever it takes to prove it. I suggest a lie detector test when I get back, or even write when I land if that's possible. Please don't make any hasty choices. I'm sorry for any disrespect I may have shown you. As we both know, getting divorced would mean losing the home you've worked so hard to improve and half of our retirement savings. Just imagine what that would mean for our kids. Mothers usually get custody when parents get divorced, so Sarah and Danielle being on my side is normal. But it would be terrible if it caused problems between them and Larry. I know how much you love the kids and wouldn't be able to see them whenever you want would be unbearable for you. Thank you for waiting until I could explain. I look forward to seeing you soon. Your loving wife, Laura. John finished reading the letter. Whatever she was doing behind the scenes would make this very interesting and moving. What do you mean, John? If you think Dave is being rude, you should know that I've seen all kinds of tricks at work. It's pretty normal. Your spouse chooses to end the marriage. As a two-week holiday, she finds a replacement and gives him a test drive. It's known as a affair on the road. In the event that she chooses him, she will return, discreetly transfer all of your property out of your reach, and then file for divorce. The sneakiest ones start by spoiling the bond between good parents and their kids, like Laura did with Sarah. Authoring a letter that makes you look like a wimp and letting Sarah read it is one of the sneakiest things I've ever seen. Limiting your partner's ability to get good help is the best way to win a divorce. Meaning they will leave you with no money and let your kids pick who they want to stay with. In this case, it's between a mother's safety in the family home and a father's basic needs while living in the streets. But there has to be another reason for that. You can ask me for proof. The three best divorce lawyers in town should be contacted. People who refuse to take your case are already working for her. They probably all got paid up front to keep you out of the case. Going broke and hiring a better lawyer will help this trick work more likely. How about the bluff? Every word in this letter is a trick. Your ex-girlfriend's lawyer must have already told her that getting custody of kids your age isn't as easy as it used to be, especially since you're likely to be seen as the main provider. The letter's purpose is to tell you to stop doing anything while she finishes getting ready for the attack. It bothers her that you learned about her plan before it was fully formed. As soon as she makes her decision, she'll want the split to be over, preferably before Larry turns 14 and can pick out his own home. 
she is likely to push you both to see a counselor. This country's courts will only give a divorce after you've lived apart for a year or if a counselor says the marriage can't be saved. She might even pick the counselor and threaten you to get you to come. Nowadays, it's normal for women to start the divorce process. Dave left the conversation to ask John about the best divorce lawyer in the area. After giving his name and asking for an appointment, he called. Informed that they could not take his case. Unfortunately for Dave, the best divorce lawyer in town was already busy with cases and told his secretary not to take on any more. In the break room, Dave returned. Okay, John. I believe in you. What do I need to do now? After you give me permission to freeze all of Laura's earnings that aren't already under her control, you can limit her access to any shared funds that are still available. How am I supposed to do that? Starting point, remove all joint credit cards. Unfortunately, I still feel nervous. Her claims that she still loves me are convincing, but they don't match up with the threats in the second part of the letter. Dear Dad, are you sure that Mom lied? Naturally. Excellent, Sarah. Mom and Dad, do you lie to the people you love? I don't hold that view. What wisdom did you always share about making relationships work? Right? Love, trust, and respect. How many of them do you see now? Well, it looks like one. Additionally, how much is mom showing? Not whatsoever. There you have it. Please read. Her two credit cards were both declined and Laura tried to pay a fine for changing her trip. Rushing to an ATM, it turned her down too. Although she knew that her hotel and food were paid for, her traveler's checks wouldn't cover much. Because she didn't have any friends to borrow from, she was afraid to ask her parents for help for fear that they would ask her awkward questions. Emailing her lawyer, she told him that the bank accounts were getting ready for a week of not spending money before she came back. Thinking about how her one simple plan was now tangled up with Dave's downfall, she understood that he must have thought she was having an affair even though he didn't know about her money moves. Alone in her room, two emails made her feel even worse about her situation. One accused her of ruining a marriage, and the other, which she sent from her own message, asked if she was telling the truth. As soon as Laura realized her kids weren't saved, she started crying for their sadness and loss. Although she told Danielle she'd explain when she got back, her daughter's immediate answer hurt deeply, questioning her decision to not spend time with them and their dad. Still crying, Laura. An expensive week was busy and dull. She brought a towel because there wasn't much to do besides relax on the beach. It only took her an hour to leave for the hotel when she realized that coming back with a tan would go against what she said. She wrote a long letter home through Sarah, implying that she had made mistakes and felt unappreciated as a wife and mother. Regarding her sense of self-worth, it emphasized how loyal she was to Dave. Not an apology, but a warning not to make hasty choices until they could talk. They sent it and waited, which is not like a confident businesswoman. Please read. Kiddos, let's talk about what to do when your mom comes back. Let's assume she'll be back on Friday since she's staying. Sarah, please go first. Without mentioning the lies she has told in the past, her most recent letter showed rudeness and dishonesty. I will stop loving her if she doesn't change. So, Danielle, what do you think? Perhaps she doesn't get it. Larry? I'm going to stay with you, Dad. My mom may have lost focus after getting promoted. There might be a second chance if she says she's sorry. Did you agree? Sarah nodded, thinking that the kids needed to be stable. Despite her last letter, Dad, I haven't seen any regret. It's my intention to make her understand how bad what she did is. We'll see how she reacts afterward. That is the plan. Please read. Laura was surprised to get a letter back from Sarah. It was written to Dave and the kids and said that Sarah would be back late Friday night and scheduled a polygraph test. She had a strong feeling of failing. 
Even though she felt like she was being told what to do, she agreed to participate in their plan because she knew it was important to show Dave that she had kept her promise. She was glad that her offer to use a lie detector was accepted, but she thought about the questions that might be asked because she was afraid they would explore her past behavior. Stressing her out too much could cause false positives on the test if she was expecting too many questions. Despite thinking about what her husband might ask, Laura practiced her answers. Despite keeping her arrival time a secret, she arrived at the airport on time. Picking a taxi, she thought her family wouldn't be waiting at the wrong airport. Unfortunately, her arrival was very different from what she had expected. Within the waiting room for the polygraph test, she went through the pre-test processes, feeling embarrassed as the technician looked over her recent past. According to Mrs. Brown, the way my questions are set up is not typical. A flowchart is used instead of a standard list, the technician stated. Yeah, that's happened to me a few times. Before the next question, there is an opening question. The next question depends on the answer. There is some delay, but I promise you that it does not affect the truth of the tests. Are you well prepared? Laura answered, ready as ever. After answering the first eight calibration questions, the operator took a break to open the file again and read Inquiry 9. About two weeks ago, you went to Bali to have sexual relations with Mr. Peter Auer while you were not married. Absolutely, Laura said. Prior to closing the file, the operator wrote down the polygraph results. Waiting for the next question, Laura wasn't sure if it would be about her real meetings with Peter in Bali or just about Peter before Bali. The worker surprised her by closing the file and taking the paper out of the machine. Dear Mrs. Brown, thank you. There is an email address where you can send the report. You are free to leave. Laura was shocked beyond belief. Just what does that mean? Can I ask one question? Actually, it's a strange one. This has only happened once, and the person who did it was trying to make a point. Whoever wrote those questions was, too. What about your husband? Laura automatically nodded. That sounds like a strange statement. Because I'm not finding my way. What your husband is probably saying is that he doesn't care if you had an affair in Bali. He just wants to be sure of your intentions. This man from Peter is making it clear that your desire to talk to him is enough for him. Enjoy your day, Mrs. Brown. The front desk has business cards for a couple of good divorce lawyers. Laura stumbled out of the room. Her entire case rested on persuading her husband that she was faithful, but she hadn't thought about how hurt he might be by her lies and plans. After being frustrated and angry, Laura made a big mistake by running home without giving herself time to think clearly. Thinking it had turned into a fight of wills, she was set on responding to Dave's first move. While the taxi took her to her neighborhood, Dave, Daniel, and Larry looked at each other somberly from across the street in their cars, thankful that they had made the necessary plans the night before. Knowing that a fight in front of the kids would hurt them, they didn't want one. Turning off their phones, they went to the room they had set up for Laura. Please read. Everyone was hoping that Laura had used the time to think when she didn't say anything until Monday. But Dave's hope was dashed when he got a letter from Sarah late Monday night. In it, his methods of involving the kids were criticized, and a family court hearing for temporary custody arrangements was referenced. John had already said that the letter would include a meeting with a counselor the next day. Also, a family meeting was scheduled for Wednesday night. Although Dave seemed to have given up on saving the marriage, Laura came up with a plan over the weekend. To better explain her point of view to Dave, she had to go to therapy, preferably with a female counselor. Her plans also included family meetings to explain what she did to the kids and getting ready for court to make sure she was ready if things got worse. Before Dave got there on Tuesday, Laura was already sitting in the counselor's office. Immediately, he liked the 40-year-old woman whose style was reminiscent of the 1960s. By putting the chairs far apart, secrecy was maintained. The psychologist asked Laura to speak first after introducing herself and Dave as Mr. Brown. 
After talking about the background of their marriage, she gave her opinion on what had happened recently. While Laura admitted that she had broken her normal vow of fidelity by lying to her family and seeing someone else, she made it clear that there was no physical cheating. After the lesson, Laura was shocked to find that her credit cards had been cancelled. She admitted that she was sorry for what she did and said she really wanted to move on with her life and get back together with Dave. Later, the psychologist spoke to Dave on behalf of herself and their children. She handled the children's complaints, pointing out that Laura had lied and been absent for a large part of her annual leave. Dave explained that he hadn't started spying on Laura while she was in Bali, which surprised Laura because she thought he had. According to him, he was told to stop his credit cards to protect their family's money only after their daughter found proof of Laura's financial tricks. Laura was shocked again. Not knowing that her safety measures had been found out, she hadn't thought about how they might be seen. Her anger was even higher because both of her daughters were openly working against her. Dave's words finally showed how upset he was about what she did offenders. The counselor started talking to Dave before Laura could answer. How do you want these lessons to help you? It's beyond my comprehension why my wife thought it was okay to lie to her family and make plans to cheat on me. Although things were bad between David and Laura at this point, their marriage could still get better. Suddenly, though, everything changed. The advisor was to blame, not the husband or wife. Almost whispered, oh, we have a dinosaur. Dave lost it because he thought Laura set up the therapy to speed up the divorce and chose a counselor on purpose to make it harder for them to get back together. He escaped the room quickly. When Laura realized that saying sorry to Dave probably wouldn't help, she turned her anger toward the counselor. She ended her ranting, but Dave had already left. The counselor told Laura she was sorry and persuaded her to set up a one-on-one -on -one lesson for the future. She later told David she was sorry for her bad behavior and had a private session with him as well. The third required session had ended, and a choice would be made about whether to keep counseling them or not. Please read. The next day's family meeting was another letdown for Laura. She had a hard time understanding that trust is something that can't be easily restored. Although Sarah had invited them to dinner before the meeting, she told her straight out that she wasn't very good at cooking, and they showed up at 7.30 p.m. Despite Laura's best efforts, they refused to hug her. When she sat down last, she felt alone because four people were staring at her accusingly. Sarah was supposed to help, but she ended up being by herself. As an alternative to a real apology, her speech was full of reasons and denials. For being a woman and the family's main earner, Laura felt undervalued. Her husband's attention had become normal, and she missed the respect that single women expected. Because she was feeling less and less secure, she gave in to the compliments of a younger guy. She had trouble meeting Dave's eyes during the conversation, and Sarah was scribbling notes irritably. She eventually stopped speaking because of the silence from what she called the opposition side. Sarah stated her dissatisfaction. Oh mom, you've let me down again. Do you know? How do I? On the cliché test, you got D85%. You'd have gotten a perfect score if you had added, who cares if they don't find out. Laura blushed, but it didn't matter if it was because she was mad or because she realized she needed to say something. Without Dave's control over her kids, she knew she wouldn't get any pity from them. David Kitchen, come on. Laura asked when they were by themselves. Privately, she talked to him about it. Why does it have to be this way? Need to be broken until you beg for forgiveness? Dave looked at her sadly, knowing that she was stuck because of who she was. I don't think so. You would be doing the right thing right now. We do not have to come to this. David, let's bypass the biased advisor and go to court. Please read. There was no sign that Dave's position would get better soon when he moved into a rented three-bedroom house on Thursday. Meanwhile, he learned that Danielle and Larry would be having a formal custody hearing the following Tuesday. After learning who the family court judge was who was assigned to his case, he talked to John. 
Luckily, the judge had previously favored Dad's getting custody. John offered to defend Dave, but Dave turned him down and asked for a meeting over the weekend to learn more about how the legal system works. Putting his children's health and safety first, he tried to use the method correctly. They fixed up the rental together over the weekend. Because Dave wanted the kids to feel like they were involved, he got them together to talk about their plans for the future of the house. When Laura's lawyer found out that Dave wanted to voluntarily defend himself, he understood the problems that could arise. Due to delays, formal issues were dealt with in court that day. The next day was scheduled for a full session. The news spread through the local media, which led to more investigation. Laura's lawyer started the next day by going over land ownership and financial details. The reporters noticed that Dave was asking questions while Laura was clearly nervous. Initially, he spoke softly and reminded her of what he had done for the family. In response, Laura confirmed this, but stressed that she was the main provider. Dave then asked about his day-to-day -day babysitting duties, bringing up his long work hours. While he was talking about her recent trip to Bali, Laura's lawyer objected, saying that cheating has nothing to do with custody issues. For clarity's sake, Dave said he was more worried about Laura's parenthood. Although the argument was overturned, Dave went on, bringing up a letter that Laura had written before her trip. Laura's outraged face said a lot. Dave continued, asking her why she hadn't said sorry when she got back. With her face showing what she was thinking, Laura didn't say a word. Honorable judge, your decision may seem clear. I have always been the main person taking care of my young children, so it's only fair that they stay with me and in the house I built for them while they were growing up. Staying true to my wife and not telling her or our kids any harmful lies has kept me loyal. I insist she fix this. Laura glared at Dave angrily as he sat there, facing away from her. Full of alertness, the judge quickly gave her ruling. She mainly said that many studies had shown that kids were usually better off living with their mom after a split. Therefore, Laura was given temporary custody and was allowed to live in the family house. Although Laura smiled proudly, Dave kept his cool. Whatever happened was exactly what he had expected after talking with John. The man got up to talk. Please let me speak to the court, your honor and commander. The cases you've already decided include Harper v. Harper, Smith v. Smith, Fulton v. Fulton, and many more. Did the main caregiver usually get custody rights? While the judge was not responding, Dave presented three scientific studies that disagree with the idea that children always do better when they are with their mother. Mr. Brown, what do you want to say? No problem, Your Honor. I'm just asking. In your case, can a man be favored? Dave was shocked and the judge looked closely at him. Later, she put the case on hold and went on to the next one. Reporters scribbled quickly. Dave handed them copies of Laura's letter and then left without looking back. Congratulations were given by Laura's lawyer, but she didn't feel happy. David's claim that she didn't feel bad about what she did hit home. Although Laura felt backed into a hole, her competitive nature wouldn't let her give up. Dave decided to fix what he saw as wrongness by blaming Laura for his situation. He identified three people who needed to be re-educated. He finalized his plans after asking Sarah for help. He got help from a government official to file a complaint against the biased judge when he got back home. Afterward, he got Danielle and Larry to stay with their mother for at least two nights. This prepared them for the next part of his plan. Two negative newspaper stories about Laura and the judge were published the next day. After saving them, Dave sent them to a friend so that they could be shared with more people. Please read. Laura got home Wednesday afternoon to find Daniel and Larry there, but their behavior showed that they were upset. Her questions about making school lunches for the next day were met with short answers. There weren't enough items for the canteen, so she gave them money for it. Laura spent half of her therapy session going over her conditions for getting back together with Dave while she was rushing to change for her 5 p.m. appointment. 
Afterward, she talked about two past bad relationships, playing down how important they were. Although Laura was confused by Dave's response, the counselor told her that they probably wouldn't be able to get back together because Dave was focusing on her intentions instead of her deeds. Tomorrow's meeting with Dave was short and heated. He told her she had two options, find a new mentor or accept that their marriage was destroyed. Due to worries about possible professional consequences, the psychologist quickly reported that the marriage had ended. More complaints to her professional group could hurt her job, she was afraid. Dave got home to find Danielle and Larry already there, looking relaxed. Officers showed up and told Dave that his kids were breaking a court order about family issues. Forcibly removing the children, even though Dave said it wasn't him but his kids, the cop warned that it would be considered assault. When asked to leave with the officer, the kids refused, and the officer left to get more information. Following this, Laura suddenly entered the house. David, this doesn't need to be our reality. Melissa and Larry should come with me. Give me the house, and I'll handle visits and property division fairly. Do not invade my space, Laura. Not forcing the kids into something they don't want to do is against their morals. David and I have known each other for a long time. You know who I am. I'm not certainly not a bad person. That's exactly it, Laura. I don't know you anymore. The woman I married would not have behaved in this pattern. Without feeling bad, she wouldn't have apologized. And she definitely wouldn't have given our counselor an option. In particular after hearing about your attempts with two other guys before Peter yesterday in counseling. When did I do something wrong to deserve this? And what do you plan to do now? The counselor's betrayal made Laura feel bad. Instead of shouting at Dave, she kept her anger in check and directed it at the psychologist. She's not supposed to inform them of that. Laura's rage elicited no response from Dave. She was angry, though, so she stormed off. Danny had put a tape recorder in Laura's purse before and after the therapy session. Dave took action and took it out. He believed that justice would be done. Yes, it did. Within three days, the mentor was fired. While one problem was fixed, two others remained. Children's services tried to help. But the kids refused to leave and insisted on staying with their dad. Laura worked hard the next week to win back her kids' approval. However, they kept their distance from her. Dave noticed that things weren't getting better so he hired John as his divorce lawyer and checked Sarah's advice. Later that week, Sarah told Dave that Laura was going on another work trip. For the whole week, Dave took time off work to help with the kids while Laura found out how her plan worked. She came home the next Friday to a shocking sight. She bought a damaged house at an insurance sale to replace her once beautiful home. Irritated and sad, she found out that the land belonged to her but not the house. When she realized she had been lied to, she tried hopelessly to get back her things but found that Sarah had legally bought them. Unfortunately, Laura's last action before losing it was to complain about how cocky she was and how her family was no longer supporting her. Does your hatred for me really go that far? Dave's mournful answer came quickly. Our feelings of dislike are contained. It was always clear that I would do anything to keep our family safe. Your actions have made it necessary for me to keep them from seeing you, which I regret. Laura gathered her things and checked into the hotel. Before she got to her destination, she stopped by Sarah's neighborhood to see how neatly the modules of her old house were set up and ready to be delivered. She spent an hour figuring out Dave's divorce papers, which seemed pretty agreeable, when she got them at work on Monday. According to the agreement, she had full ownership of land that they bought together, and her actions, including those in Bali, would be reimbursed. That included the prices of divorce and the effects of financial fraud. Because Laura wanted to keep the family together, she asked that the kids be given a choice in who would care for them. Inquiring about ending the trusts for her children, Laura talked to her financial advisor but was told it wasn't possible. Although she tried to switch tutors, it wasn't possible without Dave's permission. 
she turned down Dave's earlier offer of a new mentor. Given her restricted choices, Laura reluctantly signed the divorce papers, knowing it was the best thing that could have happened to her. Assuming care of Danielle and Larry, Laura would get money from their trusts and lose only one piece of land in value. Soon after the paperwork was completed, the divorce started right away. Laura knew that the judge in their family court case was biased toward women because he often told cases involving men to settle. As Laura relaxed, she thought about Dave's response and whether he'd agree to her terms or lose everything. After feeling more confident, Laura went into court, but her lawyer was worried about a woman in the crowd, which made her feel uneasy. It was tense in the courtroom when the judge announced her retirement. Disputes arose over legal fees, with Laura disagreeing with Dave's claim. Unfortunately, the case went downhill because there wasn't enough proof. Although the judge seemed partial, he gave custody to Dave and praised his kindness and fair distribution of property. Laura felt blindsided when she heard the decision. As soon as she got home, she realized that her plans had fallen apart and had to sell her old house in a bad area for a low price. Laura's old house, which Dave had lovingly designed, was being moved. Unfortunately, Laura only found an agency and not the new owners, so she left. Upon arriving at her new home, she thought about how little money she had made from the experience. Although writing in her diary, she decided to deal with future urges differently and to say sorry right away. She visited the new homeowners with champagne a few weeks later, thinking about what she had learned. After saying goodbye, she gave advice, telling them to be independent and treat their loved ones with care. Australian phrases were translated for clarity's sake, and she emphasized the country's disrespectful attitude toward authority, which lawmakers often exaggerate. Since I'm currently jailed, I apologize for my silence. Stories about heroes from the past comfort me, like the famous Dutch boy who stopped a flood by plugging a leaky dam. Inspire, I tried to do something similar. Currently, I'm doing my time and looking forward to being free in six months. Talking about politics, even leaders like the funny Gough Whitlam were looked at closely. Under pressure to say what he thought about feticide, he famously said, Madam, I support feticide, and in your case I would make it retroactive. This got a surprising rise in acceptance ratings.